Welcome back to the lab. Today we're going to talk about an often underrated but awesome circuit element, the humble ferrite bead. Most of us probably know about resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Those are some awesome components and they do a lot of work for us. So what's this ferrite bead all about? And why have I maybe even never heard about one of these before? Well, it's purpose is less about making something that works, less about like power supplies and microcontrollers. It's less about circuit theory and a little more nuanced. It's a little more subtle. Before we get all bogged down in the details, let's start with the basics. What is a ferrite bead? Why is it useful? And when should I use one? A ferrite bead is a passive component, much like a resistor. Passive in this context means that it's not made of silicon. It doesn't require power to function. It doesn't amplify anything. It's passive. It's that doesn't mean it's boring though. It's a pretty interesting passive component. A ferrite bead, when represented using a simplified model, is made of two resistors, an inductor and a capacitor. This mashup of components produces a bell-shaped frequency response. At low frequencies, ferrite bead has a very, very small resistance. It's basically a dead short. But as frequency increases, we eventually get to a maximum impedance of the ferrite bead. That's a couple hundred ohms. Now that's because the inductor's dominating but as the frequency continues to increase, the capacitor eventually becomes the dominating element and the equivalent resistance drops again. That's pretty neat, right? So really high frequencies can pass, really low frequencies can pass, and there's that bend in the middle where attenuation happens. Neat, uh, I guess, but what's the point? Well, let me show you a great example. Let's say there's a digital communication bus meant to carry serial information, but it's pretty slow. Uh, something like a UART or RS-45, RS-232, something like that. The frequencies that need to make it through our cable or across our board are relatively slow, some small number of kilohertz. Kilohertz typically have no problem whatsoever getting through a ferrite bead. Yeah, so we could potentially add a ferrite bead to the signal in series without putting the signal integrity in jeopardy. The interesting thing about serial data is this. Despite the fact that the data rate is slow, there are still really, really fast edges which have all sorts, colors, and kinds of high frequency energy being carried along with it. So the slower data doesn't really need it to be there, it makes it look a little nice and crispy, but that high frequency noise, that extra energy also adds the opportunity for that energy to couple into nearby traces, other signals that might be sensitive to that sort of thing under our cables and radiate into the world. And that can interfere with other nearby equipment. So. This high frequency energy isn't needed and it could cause a lot of problems, so that's not what I would call ideal. As a comparison, let's just take a moment to look at how this signal might appear after adding a series ferrite bead. Interesting. Notice how the rate of change or the slew rate of the signal is a lot slower on the edges? That's our ferrite bead doing its work. One simple component is allowing the lower frequency signals to pass while blocking high frequencies. Ferret beads can be purchased for different current levels, different maximum impedances. There are many different ferret beads to choose from. Thankfully, this is one of those situations where physics is truly behind the wheel, and I'd encourage you to simulate or calculate how effective a particular ferret bead might be for your application. It's quite common to see ferret beads near connection on PCBs that carry power or data off board over cables. Speaking of power, that reminds me of another application. There are a few different ways that sourcing multiple power supplies from the same electrical net can cause issues. One of these ways is that if the switching noise or the voltage ripple due to the switching action of one power supply couples back into the feedback network of an adjacent power supply, causing at best some voltage ripple on the output or at worst instability. A ferrite bead can be used in series between the input capacitance of a DC to DC converter and the circuit applying power to that converter. This ferrite bead is doing the exact same thing. It's allowing the DC to get through, to get into that power supply, while isolating the high frequency energy of those two nets. This causes the power supply to rely more heavily on the input capacitance to source AC currents, but that's not a huge deal if that's what it was designed for. Don't believe me? Allow me to demonstrate in LT spice. I've added two loads that look a lot like DC to DC power supplies, though admittedly these are incomplete. I'm switching some inductors. One converter is switching at 500 kilohertz and the other at one megahertz. The result is a pretty nasty source voltage waveform. In contrast, let's connect these supplies through a ferrite bead. Well, I think it's pretty immediately obvious to see that the voltage ripple on the supply feeding these two power supplies has been significantly reduced. And therefore we've probably reduce the probability that these two supplies will interfere with one another or other loads sourced from this rail. 
It's important to know that this is behaving a lot like an input filter, where an inductor with a couple capacitors could have been placed here where the ferrite beads are. And much like an input filter, this ferrite bead just became a part of the switch mode power supply control loop. It's critical that we select a ferrite bead that won't negatively impact the stability of this DC to DC converter. Placing the effects of that ferrite bead so that the impedance begins to increase significantly around the same frequency where the switching action is going on is probably a good place to start. As always, your mileage may vary and you'll have to do the math to see if this makes sense for your application. That's two awesome uses of a ferrite bead down and I could probably end this video right here, but there's one more thing I wanna talk about. There's one more way that we can use a ferrite bead. They can play a critical role in the signal level transient protection strategy ESD, or electrostatic discharge, happens to be a high frequency impulse of high voltage. If there's a dry season where you live, I'm sure you've experienced the occasional jolt while touching a metal object, and this little shock is due to a static discharge. Static discharges, or electrostatic discharges, ESD, can destroy electronics in a hurry, so let's think about how we can use the effect of a ferrite bead in a transient suppression or ESD protection type of scenario. Here's what we have. A couple ESD hits are being simulated by two kV impulses, applied to what I'll call the output of a critical circuit. Pretend this is a cable or something, and we're applying this ESD by a human hand getting close to the connector. From the load, energy can enter the critical net of our circuit through the ferrite bead L3. Now let's imagine this is the power pin of a microcontroller, something that wouldn't like two kilovolts being applied. So to dump this energy down to ground, we added a TVS or a transient voltage suppression diode that's present to take some of that energy on and that's paired with a small decoupling capacitor placed close to the critical circuit that should kind of take on what's left and hopefully keep things reasonable. The combination that you see here, combining a transient suppression diode with a decoupling capacitor and a series for a bead to add some impedance there, man, it's awesome. These components together do an excellent job of protecting the critical net from this impulse. Sure, there's some ringing, the voltage goes up a little bit, but that 2 kV impulse is reduced to a much more manageable 15 volts. Adding provisions like this to places where a user can electrically interact with a device is very helpful. And thinking about transient suppression is a great way to ruggedize a design. The general idea is that we need to add some series impedance between potential energy entry points and the circuit that needs protection. We need to provide a safe coupling path for the unwanted energy to ground around the circuit so it doesn't find a path through the circuit. ESD, like most energy, will find a path to ground. It'll find a way to get where it wants to go, and we're using the combination of a TVS and a capacitor to provide that path, protect the circuit as a result. Ferrite beads sound pretty great to me. I don't know about you. We walked through the fundamental theory of a ferrite bead, the equivalent circuit model, and three critical applications for this component. Basically, it comes down to elimination or reduction of high frequency energy from low frequency digital communication, electrically isolating the switching noise from the DC current input of free running switch mode power supplies and transient protection. If you like this video and you wanna see more, consider subscribing because we will continue building and testing this UPS prototype. If you wanna support the channel, consider checking out the products that we feature today through our Amazon affiliate links in the description. Really helps us out a lot. Thank you. I think the ferrite beads are great. In fact, we're using a lot of ferrite beads in our new UPS design. If you agree, let me know by hitting the like button on this video or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone and thank you for staying till the end. Bye.